Hat in Time is one of those special kind of games that's just chock full of Easter eggs and fun bits of attention to detail, which is what we'll be looking at in this video. Yay. Like for example, there is a mountain of pillows in Hat Kid's bedroom. If you use the ice hat, you can drop down into her secret pillow fort, which contains Hat Kid's diary. What some players might overlook is the fact that the diary actually updates after every act of every chapter, giving us a nice look into the character of Hat Kid. Also, nearby, there's a toy box that, when open, gives a single pawn. Using the camera badge, we can peek inside to find all kinds of stuff. Some of it stands out, like there's a little spaceship, which has buttons laid out in a vaguely N64 control scheme. Also, more than a few of the objects actually reference scrapped character designs, like this weirdly flickering one of a sandworm, which I think was going to be a merchant in the level Sand and Sails, which is the level that eventually became Alpine Skyline. Also, there's a science owl, which was what the conductor owls would have originally been. His clipboard has a chart explaining that Mafia and Little Girl are dumb, Seagull is smart, owls are very smart, and Kickstarter backers are the smartest. Oh, also tucked away under the owl is a knife! Oh, Hat Kid should uh, really return that to the kitchen. Unrelated. If you check Hat Kid's closet, you get this text explaining that since you only wear w one outfit, there's lots of room for skeletons. <laughs> what a great play on words, not spooky at all, also completely unrelated. If you idle long enough, strange noises can be heard reverberating from somewhere in the ship. Normally, this takes at least 20 minutes to happen, but with the power of editing, it's just long enough to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. In the past, if you wanted to make a website, you'd need to wear all kinds of hats. Programmer, designer, other technical terms, Squarespace has everything you need to create and host a website built right into their all-in-one platform. Instead of messing around deep in the gears of web development, you can spend your valuable time building your site however you want. There's plenty of beautiful templates to help you get started, and then adding new pages and other elements often take just a single click. As such, creating my hypothetical Snatcher fan site has never been easier. I'd love to spend more time sharing my poorly thought out puns, but instead, let me save you some time and even money. Head over to squarespace.com slash dpedgamer, or use the link in the description, to sign up for a free trial, and then, when you're ready, use code dpedgamer for 10% off your first purchase. Again, that's squarespace.com slash dpedgamer, and code dpedgamer for 10% off your first purchase. That said, big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Oh, I think my time clock is time ringing, which means the noises are about to start. Spooky. This is also completely unrelated, but the bedroom is also home to the start of a cryptic series of messages penned by someone or something named R. King. The first is underneath the purple chair, which points us towards the red toolbox. That's the one next to the not a Nintendo game dodecahedron. That leads us to the kitchen, which then sends us down to the basement. This note in the basement was originally behind the washing machine with the circular door, but this room was changed with the Seal the Deal DLC. I looked and looked, and I even clipped the camera out of bounds accidentally, but it just seems like the note is gone. Still, it would have pointed us down towards the lab, where we find a note in the green microwave looking machine, which sends us to the machine room, which then sends us to the attic. It's here that the hunt for the R King concludes, as there is a small hole under the stairs, which leads to the King's castle. While I don't think this means much outside of it being a fun yet weird easter egg, one can assume that our king, aka Roach King, there turned himself and everything else into gold before moving on in one way or another. He also leaves behind a couple of messages, as you can see here. Also, when I reached out to my community for input on this game's easter eggs, YouTube user MarioFan665 pointed out that you can find the same hole at the end of the tour rift, which instead of a castle holds a strange miniature portal thing, which is neat. Switching gears a bit, the radio near the Chapter 2 telescope has text that mentions acquaintances at the table, goodbye from Sunshine Town, and two brothers, and then also a third additional brother, myself. These are actually referencing podcasts. Specifically, Friends at the Table, Welcome to Night Vale, and My Brother, My Brother, and Me. That last one being a personal favorite of mine. Also, in Chapter 2, there is a warning sign that calls you out for being a silly goose for zooming in on it. Which is funny because I specifically put out a request on Twitter because I couldn't figure out where it was from. And Twitter user here helped me identify that it can be found in Chapter 2 of Act 6, which is probably the exact opposite of what they wanted for this sign. Also, in Chapter 2... 
During the Murder on the Owl Express, there is a large TV in the VIP room with a title screen reminiscent of Metal Gear Solid. Much like the TV in the spaceship, the Borks in these are from Gabe the Dog, an internet legend that'll live on in this game and our hearts. In that same level, later on is a screen in the room labeled Keep Out, which shows Hat Kid's anatomy. So, uh, yeah, there's there's ribs, uh, femurs, that, that's right, a, a skull, a very small brain, okay, uh, candy in her hat, and even bones in her ponytail. Yeah, that, that checks out. Okay. Also, the TV at the beginning of Train Rush shows an animation reminiscent to the opening of Kirby's Adventure, which explained how to draw Kirby. This was another suggestion by MarioFan665, so thank you for that. And this animation might be familiar because we talked about a very similar one in the Mario Game & Watch video that I covered previously. Moving on to Chapter 3, there is a bunch of stuff contained inside of Vanessa's Manor, and I'm not just talking about spookiness. So, there are a bunch of frozen characters, many of which are actually cut or scrapped characters from earlier in development. Going in alphabetical order, there's the oldster, a tall, scared, undressed old man who was supposed to do what the Goofa Mafia does in the final game, basically being the chase victim in She Came From Outer Space. The oldster was removed about a year before the game's release, as there wasn't enough time for character development. There's also Rough Patch, aka Bush Cat a cut enemy which would have appeared in Subcon Forest, but uh, does appear here so it's almost in its home environment, I guess? Also, there is the Shapeshifter, a character who originally would have appeared, I think, as like the murderer in what would become Murder on the Owl Express. And also Thor, the character who was supposed to be the one who set up all the robots and hookshot points in Mafia Town. And also, while we're at it talking about cut characters, I'll mention Moonjumper, the scrapped antagonist for Chapter 3, a puppeteer, and a lot of his elements ended up getting absorbed by Snatcher, who ended up being a pretty awesome character, so I don't mind that much. There's also Tim, CEO of Time, a character who appeared in the pre-release and prototype versions of the game, and also there was Tim's friend, a two-dimensional black and white spirit who would, along with Tim, help with early tutorials. Now for other stuff in the manor, hey, uh, did you know that there is actually a small crawl space between a couple of the barrels in the manor's basement, which takes the player directly to the addict? This is a perfect spirit on shortcut, and also a easy way to skip the spooky horror section if you are so inclined. And uh, while we're there, at the top of Vanessa's Manor, there is a glowy bit of art that resembles the goggle-wearing, often glowy-eyed Rasputin from Psychonauts, which I think is pretty neat. Oh, while we're here, I should mention that Vanessa's Manor has an unused third floor that can still be reached using good old console commands. By designs, it's pitch black and would have included Snatcher disguised as a doppelganger of Hat Kid. However, the devs deemed it not fun, and it would have needed to be totally overhauled for the puzzle to work, so they decided to scrap it. That said, even completely lit, the floor is straight up spooky with a healthy dose of unsettling. Also, uh, that one glowing, moving, demonic red eye always staring at you, just out of you, that's a nice touch. I like that one. Now, before we talk about stuff from Seal the Deal, I want to talk about this Twitter post made by the official Hat in Time Twitter, which said, Fun fact, we had a Seal the Deal DLC, Death Wish Hidden Easter Egg, on our website for over six months before the DLC was announced. Don't think anyone found it, or if they did, they didn't snitch. Which is pretty neat. I guess sometimes stuff just goes overlooked. Not overlooked, in Death Wish, Snatcher has a voice line that actually references the Al is Real 2401 rumor, you know, from Mario 64. Did you know you could unlock Luigi by completing every Death Wish on the first attempt? I don't even know what that is, but that has to be genuine. I read it online. I don't have much to say there, it's just it's just great. Now, in Chapter 6, Arctic Cruise, there is this cabinet in the kitchen, where if you go and crawl into there, Hat Kid will put a discarded cookie in her mouth, which will stay there until you close the game or leave the level. Also nearby, there is a hidden death wish where you have to kick six cans behind the reception desk, which is so obnoxious and so pointless, but if you want to do it, there is one can on the floor nearby, another up on this walkway, a third outside the door, two more up on the nearby platform, and then one final one, which is the hardest to get. If you try, try, try again, 
and eventually get them all down and back behind the receptionist desk, you'll get a pair of golden shades, which is awesome and also takes the shape of a golden turkey for some reason. So it's so pointless and I wasted like a half hour for this, but I did it! And you can do it too, if you want, I guess. That's, that's the thing. Also on the Arctic cruise, there is a daycare, which has a clipboard, which if you zoom in on, reads, notes for the day. Here's my theory on Mole Man. You see, one time I walked in on my mom who was talking about some Mole Man, and my eyes widened like some anime dude, cause let me tell you, I thought Mole Man was just a myth in some game, so I ran up to her and grabbed her face and said, is it true? Is Mole Man real? And she looked at me like I was some madman, and that's when it hit me. It's not Mole Man, but Mud Man. I, I am mad, I don't even have a mom. There is another reference to Mole Man tucked away inside this dresser back in the spaceship's attic. If you use the Dweller Mask, a cipher is revealed. Once decrypted, it reads, Two stars, a black hole, gateway of light, the forgotten temple, a message of hands, pillars of fire, the souls of his people, reigning sun, the truth between two travelers of time, a peaceful garden, the promise of a hat. This is completely meaningless. Sorta. So, you see, the Mole Man was the mysterious figure at the center of a Hat in Time related ARG or alternate reality game which took place near the game's original release. There was a Mole Man YouTube channel which had cryptic videos with cryptic descriptions and even uh, two different mods made by one of the game's developers as part of the ARG. The lore that the ARG contained has since been deemed not canon and thus it doesn't mean all that much these days. But still, it remains as one of those neat easter eggs in the game that's just sort of there. Just sort of like the <laughs> various locations you can find where there is a wheel of cheese that says sawed off, which is basically like go away in uh, other terms. There is one in the smokestack of Chapter 2's train, there is one on the top of this building in Picture Perfect, and there is even a giant one inside the giant yellow sun that's approximately half a solar system away from the spaceship. As if that wasn't enough, there is another cheese, which is super notable in Arctic Cruise right at the start, which requires co-op and you flinging yourself up there, or you could just cheat, but once you interact with it, you get this super confusing interaction. Just, just, just watch. Uh. Yep, that's, that's definitely a thing. Heading into chapter seven. Okay, let me explain. Yakuza Metro has a secret mini boss called Miyajima, who can be reached by following the route I showed previously, and then interacting with the cover that you end up next to, which kicks off this really weird love letter to Gora Mijima. You up. Time to bring out your fighting spirit! As you may know, there is a bunch of purchasable outfits and flair, one of them being headphones, which on each side has a QR code. One of them reads, check the other side, and the other reads, you're a dummy, lol. Uh, in the yellow station, you'll get to this part where if you look up, you can see a pretty neat flag. And on either side, there are two rooms, each containing weird looking characters, which are actually Kickstarter backers, which is pretty neat. Also, this is super weird, but partway through Nakusa Metro Purple Rift, there is a spear that can be found, which outputs Morse code. Once translated, I believe it says they put bugs in him, which I think is a reference to Kingdom Hearts Recoded. Mickey, it's Riku. They put bugs in him. What? Oh, and uh, jumping to the end of the game, not really a spoiler, but did you know there's actually a fake out ending that you can experience by leaving when prompted by Mustache Girl before the final battle. If you leave and then accept the multiple incredulous prompts that like, why would you do this? You're leaving? Not even going to put up a fight? Perfect. 
pathetic. It shows Hackett running and crying and tumbling down to kick off the saddest credit sequence ever. Which is then cut short by the cheers of the NPCs we've come to know throughout the game. And then Hat Kid gets up to go back to the fight, which is oddly... It's, it's, it's oddly inspiring. Uh, but then you could go and do it again if you want, which is fun. Thank you for watching, thanks to my channel members for the support, and an out of this world thanks to Christy Country, Pseudonymous, Jermaine Jerkillis Rhodes, and Captain Crayfish for being super fans. If you like this video, maybe leave a like, subscribe if you want, and uh, why not check out some of my other videos, two of which also feature at in time. That's it for this video, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.